A very warm welcome to you. This is World Business Report. I'm Alice Baxter. In just a moment, we'll be talking about the Fed's annual conference in Jackson Hole and who will replace Ben Bernanke when he steps down in January. But first day this hour, we start with this. Of course, it dominates Times Square in New York, but its global importance is huge as well. The world's number two stock market and the largest electronic one, the Nasdaq, is where shares are traded in some of the world's most valuable companies, the likes of Apple, Google and Microsoft. And on Thursday, at exactly 40 minutes and three seconds past 12 local time, it all broke down. All trading was halted for three hours. Well, the company that runs it blamed a technical glitch and says it's working to investigate the issues. Well, there's now huge pressure on the Nasdaq and its boss. Rico Oi was there for us. Well, behind me is the world's biggest electronically traded stock exchange, where more than 3,000 companies' shares are listed and traded. They're mainly technology firms, including big household names like Apple, Google and Microsoft. But for more than three hours on Thursday, no trading could take place. It is a highly unusual incident. The last time it happened was back in the 90s when power went out. But it does add to a list of high-profile technical glitches that the US stock exchanges have been having. The most recent memory was during Facebook's share sale, when the Nasdaq in fact had to pay a big fine for the technical issues. There was also an incident in May 2010 known as a flash crash when 1,000 points were wiped out from the Dow Jones in 15 minutes before recovery. While the implication of this incident is still not yet known, it is a stark reminder that as computers replace people in electronic trading, the system can be very vulnerable. Well, let's move from Manhattan, where Marika Oi was there for us, to uh, this beautiful spot. Uh, it's the mountains of northern Wyoming, where the attentions of global markets usually turn at this time of the year, because it's the location of the U.S. Federal Reserve's annual conference at Jackson Hole. Well, for weeks now, global markets have been analysing every word coming out of the U.S. Central Bank, and this gap in particular, of course, its boss, Ben Bernanke. But for once, Mr. Bernanke will be out of the limelight, because this year he's not actually attending Jackson Hole. It's the first time a Fed chairman has missed the event in a quarter of a century. Well, covering for him will be this lady. She is the vice chair of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen. And she's had quite a low profile in the past, but could we be looking at the first ever female boss of the Fed when Mr. Mabanke steps down come January? Here's Michelle Fleury in New York. He's the world's most important central banker, yet Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, has decided to skip this weekend's monetary policy shindig. Each year, the world's most senior monetary policy officials gather in this scenic resort for a meeting that's become known as the who's who of global central banking. But the head of the Fed isn't the only one he'll be missing. The governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, and European Central Bank head Mario Draghi have also decided to stay home. In fact, a lot of the action may take place miles away, in Washington. Over the next few months, the occupant of the White House must decide who will replace Mr Bernanke when his term ends in January. The leading contenders include former US Treasury Secretary Larry Summers and Fed Vice Chair Janet Yellen. So what is likely to come out of this meeting? With Ben Bernanke staying away, those looking for clarity on the future direction of US monetary policy will have to rely on the minutes from last July's meeting, which were released earlier this week. Instead, expect a lot more focus on the international dimension of monetary policy. Unofficially, you may also get a lot more chatter on who will succeed Mr Bernanke to become the world's most important central banker. Michelle Fleury, BBC News, New York. Well, to talk Ooh. through the Jackson Hole intrigues, uh, let's talk to you, Kanulia, Mayor of MRL. Many thanks for coming in this morning. So what should we read into the fact that Ben Bernanke is going to be the first Fed chairman not to be at Jackson Hole for a quarter of a century? Well, we should read two things into it. One is he is no longer going to be Fed chairman as of January, so he's a little bit of a lame duck, um, as, as you, if you can be that, uh, Fed chairman, one. And B, you, ha you see that not only he, but also Mr Draghi from the ECB and, um, and our central bank governor 
are not attending. So the three central bank governors who really have the economy on steroids, on, on, on big quantitative easing packages, are not attending to avoid precisely that question. I like that idea that they've got the economies on steroids. Let's talk about uh, Janet Yellen again. How is it significant is it that uh, she's going to be there in Mr. Bernanke's place? Are we looking at the first female Fed chairman, potentially? Well, we may, but there is always La Larry Summers in the wings as well. And the thing is, she's not giving a keynote address. She's just chairing a panel. And we, I think we should be reading something into that. She's there, but pretty low-key actually. So if you had to put money on who's going to replace Mr. Bernanke, who would you go for? Um, I would go 50-50 at this point. But, you know, who knows? I mean, we, we would have to ask Mr. Obama, I guess, to, to get that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get on to that straight away for you, Good. Uh, Cornelia Mayer of MRL, many, many thanks. Uh, now, this week, we've been looking at the impact of the internet on the publishing industry with the rapid increase in self-published books around the world. Major publishing houses are having to find new ways to maintain their market share. So can the industry rise to the challenge of the internet? Philip Hauschier reports. This may look like a trailer for a new hit movie. Instead, it's for a novel. 30-second films posted on websites is one way publishers are fighting to get people to buy more books. This is the uh, Pizza Pilgrim's interactive e-book. Publishers are finding ways to make books more interactive. It has various features that the book doesn't have. Tick off the ingredients as you use them, add them to your shopping list. With greater competition from large numbers of self-published authors, major companies are using their big budgets to reclaim the initiative in the digital revolution. Ebooks are an important part of what we do, but it's also about all these other platforms that we can we can show our content on, that we can tell stories on, um, that we can we can get our content discovered on, and indeed monetize it for our authors. Um, and I think that the, the publishers who really understand that. And if you like, move from being just book publishers into being multimedia content producers as well are the ones that will succeed. Of course, even with all the new social marketing techniques available to publishing houses, it's not going to take away from some of the old favourites, like authors' signings. There we go, thank you. Older marketing techniques from word of mouth to newspaper reviews still help sell books. And that'll continue even though digital books are growing fast. For the moment, the physical book market is still larger. Claire Alexander is a top literary agent. She thinks that major publishers will have to do more than rely on marketing techniques and interactive books. In the internet, everything is equal. Um, and maybe the reason people buy a book is chiefly price or brand. Um, in the absence of those two things, what you need is a recommendation. And actually at the moment, publishers have forgotten to be the recommender. With more and more books out there, I think people might be prepared to pay a little bit more for something that has the imprimatur of a trusted publisher. Simply hold your smartphone over any of the images. With the if the major publishing houses have their way, you may need a tablet, computer or mobile phone to get the most from books in the future. Page seven. When I look at this picture, I think I wonder what must be going on inside his head. They're hopeful that that and their experience can help them stay ahead at the tsunami of self-published authors. Philip Hampshire, BBC News. OK, some other news for you now. US drug maker Eli Lilly says it's deeply concerned about allegations in a Chinese newspaper that it spent almost $5 million to bribe doctors in China to prescribe its medicines. Eli Lilly is the third foreign drug maker to face whistleblower accusations in the newspaper this month alone. Well, the report coincides with multiple Chinese investigations into the pharmaceutical sector spanning alleged corruption to how drugs are priced. Let's have a quick look to see how markets in Asia are getting on this morning. And for the most part, they're up after that uh, better than expected economic data that we had coming out of both China and uh, the European Union. That's the way things look at the moment. The Nikkei in Japan currently up nearly 3%. The Hang Seng in Hong Kong also up 0.53%. Similarly positive picture across the rest of the region. So clearly markets there not suffering from any glitches like the Nasdaq, as we were saying. Back in a moment for a look through the newspapers with Sally, do stay with us.
journey begin. Hello, welcome to Football Focus. We are officially on tour. You may well recognise this place. Look at this. Welcome to Barcelona. Hola, soy Andres Iniesta. You're watching Football Focus. Not a bad stadium, is it? I'm joined by a true legend of the game in the studio today, Ian Rush. I'm sure you recognise Didier Man, a stalwart of this programme. The hand of experience, Mr Mark Lawrenson, is with us today. It's the power of football. What a delight. We have the Liverpool legend, Robbie Fowler, with us today. Fabrice Moamba, delighted to have you on the programme. We have a man known in Ireland as Zinedine Kilbaum. It's been a fairly dramatic week. I just didn't have a break for years and years and years. At the moment, I can guarantee you, no. We have a, a really good team, one of the best in the history of the club. As each year goes along, I go older, and yeah. it's a fact of life. <laughs> I can I can avoid that. The emotion makes a difference. A difficult decision, but I think that I made the, the right one. It would have been nice to stay in the Premier League, but things don't last forever. Unfortunately enough, it doesn't always work like that. That is the magic of Football Focus. I'm Sally Bundock. Let's remind you of our top stories this hour in international news. One million children have fled the violence in Syria. Tens of thousands have sought refuge in Lebanon, but most haven't registered with the government and are surviving by selling toys and other trinkets on the streets. The United Nations has urged the Syrian government to allow its weapons inspectors to investigate Wednesday's alleged chemical attack near Damascus. Opposition activists say hundreds of people were killed. The disgraced Chinese politician Bo Xilai has appeared in court on day two of his trial. Mr Bo is accused of, track, of taking millions of dollars in bribes and covering up his wife's involvement in the murder of a British businessman. The Israeli military says it's carried out an airstrike in Lebanon on what it called a militant target. Israel says the bombings are in retaliation for the four rockets fired into northern Israel from the south of Lebanon on Thursday. So let's have a look now at the international press. Uh, many stories that we're covering, they are as well, of course. So let's start with The Independent, the UK newspaper, which claims a leak from NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden reveals that Britain is running a secret internet monitoring station in the Middle East. And moving on, the International Herald Tribune, it says outrage is growing in the West over the possible use of chemical weapons by the Syrian government, but uh, numerous diplomatic obstacles stand in the way of any prompt action. The South China Morning Post, of course, looks at lots of stories, but it's got a business survey showing the world's economies are on the road to recovery. The paper says this will bolster the case for the US Fed to withdraw support for the American economy. The Gulf News says a blame game is taking place over the collapse of the Indian rupee, with the finance minister saying don't panic, uh, while opposition rivals are calling it a financial holocaust. The state-sponsored China Daily claims that social media means the trial of disgraced politician Bo Xilai is breaking new ground for transparency. And the Daily Telegraph features a warning from the Oscar-winning Hollywood actor Kevin Spacey that entertainment TV must embrace internet streaming services or be left behind. Well, we're joined by Cornelia Mayer, CEO of MRL Business, uh, sorry, Corporation Business Consultancy, to talk us through today's stories. Lovely to see you, Cornelia. Great as to ever. see you. So let's start with the Independent, and uh, it is firmly on its front page. Is the next chapter, as it were, in this story about what's coming out of the Edward Snowden information. It talks about uh, this huge um, internet monitoring station in the Middle East, run by Britain's uh, secret service or what have you and it's sharing information with the US no big surprise to hear that I guess no big argue? surprise and I and I'm glad they're doing it look uh, if you look if you if you if you live in the US 
or if you live in the United Kingdom, you may be, you know, you may be subject to some terrorist attacks. So I think it's a, it's a very good thing that they're doing it, and um, it's it's no surprise. And I think MI6 would not be doing their job if they didn't do it. I mean, the, the question the Independent raises, though, I mean, it admits as well, this is no surprise to hear this, but they're talking about the scope and scale of it, which they can't print about or have not printed about, that they say that would raise eyebrows. And it's the whole danger of that catch-all term in the interest of national security and the impact that has Absolutely. on the freedom of the Absolutely, and who watches the watchdog? I mean, here we probably, what we probably learned from the Snowden affair is that we need to have somebody with the appropriate security clearance, some watchdog who watches our watchdogs. You mean, we need to have a watchdog for the watchdogs. Mm. Whether that will happen or not. Exactly, exactly. It's is a another matter. Balance, but hey. It? <laughs> um, exactly. Um, the International Herald Tribune, it um, focuses on um, the terrible things that are happening in Syria, doesn't it? And this outrage in the West about whether or not chemical weapons have been used there. And also uh, touching on the sort of impasse within the international yeah. community. Yeah. No, and I think it means it's just, it's, it's heart wrenching. It's, it, it's, mm. it's, it's, you know, it's just beyond words what is happening and the, the millions and millions of civilians that are suffering and that have to leave their country. It's just, you know, our hearts have to go out to those people. Um, and we have an impasse and the thing is how can we make the UN um, you know, have more bite. We have UN weapons inspectors there. And even Russia, who is, you know, on the Security Council, not always with the West, says, look, they really need to give access to the UN security, um, to, to UN um, weapons inspectors to go and have a but look. But the longer they leave it in terms of allowing them in, the less the, likely absolutely. or the harder it will be to, to actually get to the bottom of what really happened and, and who is responsible. And, you know, the, the, the question that the West has is, you know, we went into Libya, we went into we went into um, Afghanistan. We went into Iraq. None of it has been so terribly, terribly successful. And if you look at the opposition, it's so fragmented, and it's hard to see who's with whom and who's really behind them. So, it's not an it's not an easy thing. But really, our hearts have to go out to all these civilians who are suffering, and and, and we are hopeless, helpless. We can't help them. The very particular issue here, though, as you were suggesting, Sally, and uh, the BBC set up its own special Syria desk. Uh, focusing on this is because of the particular kind of nerd agent they suspect has been used there it doesn't hang around in the atmosphere so there is a finite window yeah. in which mm. they can actually go yeah. in to assess if it has it's, been used or not yeah. So yeah. time is really and against them. It's, it's, re it's really against them, and there should really be some mechanism by which, you know, UN weapons inspectors can go in. They have a pre-agreed protocol which doesn't allow them to do that, but yeah. that's not good. Now, the Chinese press very much focused on the case of uh, Bo Xi Lai, and we'll get to that in a second. But first of all, uh, the business section of South China Morning Post looks at all the data we got yesterday. So. Uh, the story about Chinese factories seeing uh, a, a jump back to growth in August, that was a surprise, but also it touches on U.S. manufacturing and it all kind it, of it concludes all, it looks good. Even the Eurozone the can take And the, the Eurozone is, is good, but when you look, when you dig deeper with the Chinese numbers, some of it comes from big infrastructure projects, so some of it is sort of state-led. Well, the Fed can taper, but you know the Fed has given itself limitations. Unemployment has to be to be lower than 7.5 percent. Inflation has to be below 2.5 percent. And if you look at the last min, um, Fed minutes, they said they may even go for a lower um, t a target on on, unif on on unemployment. That's so related to interest rate increases, though, yeah, isn't it? Not so yeah. much the the, 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 the tapering, tapering of, of monetary stimulus. So we will we will we will see. They will they will have to wane off. I think they have learned their lesson from having made bold statements and they will do it easily, easily, easily and slowly, slowly, slowly in order not to spook the markets too much. Well, another um, <laughs> impact... Being oh, I was going to say, another <laughs> impact of what uh, the Federal Reserve is saying, and of course we were just talking earlier, Camilla, about the impact of what Mr Ben Bernanke says around the world, and it's having an impact in India, isn't it, on the rupee, which uh, for five days now has just been sliding and sliding. Oh, yes, I mean, it's, it's down 20% from the beginning of the year. There have been, since the 1st of Ju June, there have been $12 billion of capital outflows. And part of that is the economy in, in emerged markets 
market's going, getting better. Um, thinking that um, yields going up also in, in bonds in emerged markets, uh, thinking that if yields go up, money will go away from the high yielding um, uh, economies of emerging markets and go back into emerged markets. It's kind of the unintended consequences, isn't it, of all these yeah. different things. I mean, for example, all this, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the steroid action of the central banks, yeah. whether they be in the US, UK or, or Europe to a degree, um, the impact it's had on the emerging markets, bubbles perhaps being created because yeah. cheap money is available, borrowings available, and now absolutely. And you the see that, that the economies with large current account deficits, uh, India, Indonesia, Turkey, Brazil, are the ones worst hit. So they're uh, particularly yeah. susceptible. Absolutely. To uh, a decrease in foreign now, investment. China Daily. Uh, we must emphasise this is a, a state-sponsored newspaper, but it looks on its front page as most of the Chinese press at this case going on in Jenin of. Uh, Borshi Lai. Now it says here the case breaks ground for transparency. Give us your take on to what degree it is groundbreaking. I think it is, you know, it's the first time you have a court having some, it, their own little blog on what's going on. And I think they're trying uh, with new media to, 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 to get more information out there compared to what's happening in the West. It's I mean, probably no not that the journalists are allowed in the yeah, courtroom. Exactly. They've got about 16 journalists in there who yeah. are exactly. but sending out information. Exactly. But when you look at what happens in, let's say, US courts, journalists can go in, but, you know, you can't take photographs. So it's... It's, it's courts are, are a difficult thing. It's more transparent than it used to be, but it's no way near as transparent as it would be in the UK or the US. Of course not, but we'll see how it continues because our correspondent there, John Sudworth, was saying actually the information flow today has been quite a bit less than yesterday on day one, but uh, we shall Such see. Such a fascinating case, but it's, it's it? but it's it's a good thing because it's it's a very hard case for the Chinese establishment given how important Bo Xilai was. A quick uh, final look at the Daily Telegraph, the business page there. Kevin Spacey uh, giving this McIntyre lecture up at the Edinburgh Film Festival, talking about how a television needs to be careful unless it's left behind with the sort of internet revolution. Yes, and he says, you know, we have a lot of people who are very established and the new creative talent doesn't come in and everything is so expensive and the internet revolution makes things cheaper and gives more voice to the young creative talent and if if television doesn't give voice to young creative talent it will be left behind where will we be then yeah thank you very much cornelia thank appreciate you. that a look at today's newspapers thank you too for your company we'll see you soon